Welcome to this evening's ZSL Science and Conservation event, where we're going to be discussing habitat loss and human health. We've got four fantastic speakers lined up for you to tonight. But before we hear from them, I'd like to make sure you're all aware of how you can ask our speakers questions during the event. There are a couple of different ways that you'll be able to do this. So I'll just bring up my screen now so that you can see. One uh, way that you will be able to answer questions this evening is by going to Pigeonhole. Um, so all you need to do is type in www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1960. That's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1960. And there you'll be able to ask questions throughout the event for our speakers, but also most importantly, you'll be able to upvote questions as well, which will make it easier for us to see which are the most popular questions and try and ensure that we tackle those during the event. If you're having problems getting onto Pigeonhole, the other way you can ask our speakers questions during the event is by emailing. So please do send your questions to scientific.events at zsl.org. That's scientific.events at zsl.org. The other thing I'd like to mention before we go any further is that we really welcome your feedback and thoughts at the end of the event. And so we have set up a survey monkey online for this. Um, you can go to that survey by typing in www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event two. But I'll be reminding you of that link at the end of the event. So as I mentioned, we're going to be hearing from four different researchers this evening. And the first speaker tonight is Dr. David Redding, who is a research fellow at ZSL and also the, conv the convener of tonight's event. He's going to be discussing how habitat loss impacts human disease risk. So Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Well, thanks very much for um, that introduction and thanks very much ZSL for um, hosting us and also thanks to our great set of speakers that agreed to join. And so what I want to do is talk about, uh, I'm just going to bring up my presentation. So what I want to do is give some of the background to some of the things that our speakers are going to be uh, talking about next. So to give a sort of background to some of the topics that they're, they're likely to be discussing. And so broadly, this meeting is focusing on the idea of um, habitat loss and how that might impact us in terms of our health. And so this is a obviously a topic that is of uh, high current interest. And so it's uh, something, it's, it's an area that that I personally have been working on for, for about uh, sort of 10 years. And so I think it's uh, really, it's really great that, that people are so interested and um, wanting to engage with it. So what, so, that, so what I'm going to be focusing on mostly are zoonotic diseases. So the recent events have made it um, much more straightforward to, for me to give talks a lot of the time because people understand the idea that diseases can be uh, caught from animals and there's a variety of different ways that that can occur. So it can be through sort of direct contact where people um, go and say, catch an animal for food or through sort of um, animal sort of livestock, uh, sort of husbandry processes and also through pets and um, through things like uh, biting insects that carry diseases from one animal uh, to two people. So this is a process that isn't um, sort of rare. It's something that goes on throughout, uh, throughout the world, throughout all levels of biodiversity. Um, organisms are sharing um, these sort of uh, pathogens or, you know, sometimes they're not pathogens, sometimes they're microorganisms, just swapping between species and individuals within a species. So this is happening all the time. And so, this is only a really big problem when those, uh, those 
microorganisms, the viruses and bacteria and, and sort of single cell parasites that are, are transferred between species um, and from species to people when they cause disease. And so here are some examples of uh, diseases that have e either a wild, wildlife source or a livestock source um, or, or both, where, where both uh, domesticated animals and wild animals are involved. So we've got things like Lyme disease and Ebola, which are principally caught by people from wildlife. And then we've got things like E. coli, Rift Valley fever in, in, in um, West Africa, sorry, East Africa. Uh, and, and then we've got uh, ones where they're either both livestock and wildlife are involved. So things like rabies and anthrax and plague. So there, there's, a, there's a huge variety of uh, zoonotic diseases. In fact, most diseases are, um, most ones, the, the, the vast majority of diseases that we know, excuse me, are um, animal born. So they come from animals and nearly all human diseases originally had a, 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 an animal origin. So <clears throat> why are we talking about habitat change? Well, if, if most diseases have this wildlife origin and, and a lot of diseases have a wildlife component, we need to think about what's happening to wildlife. And, that, and, 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 and by understanding that, we're going to understand about how, um, how, what, what our future health is going to look like. And so probably the most immediate sort of systemic sort of global threat to, to wildlife is, is land use change. And that is the process by which people are taking the world and taking different sort of natural habitats, so things like rainforests and, and deserts and grasslands, and, and turning them into habitats that suit our needs. So ones where we get we get things that we need, such as just food or shelter or or sort of recreation thing. We're, we're converting it into 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 types of landscapes that are useful for us. So so one example is is urbanization, so increasing amounts of habitat where we're living, we're actively living on. And then there's also habitats that we're converting or, or using for grazing. And also just for, um, for uh, vegetable uh, food, uh, vegetative food production. So that's um, sort of cropland areas. And well, this has happened Obviously, the world the world's been changing for, for a long time, but what we're seeing recently, and so here we're, we're talking from 1900, we've got approximately a doubling of, of the total area of the world that is covered in, in both cropland and grazed areas and, and in, in built up areas. And so we're seeing this increasing imprint of, of, the, of, human, of humans on, on the earth. So more and more of the earth is being converted into these these, these particular types of, of uh, landscapes. So why does this matter? Well, here's a paper by uh, Tim Newbold and colleagues from 2015, and it seems very complicated when you first look at it, but if, if we just start uh, um, in panel A, that's where all, all, all of the sites were, and I'll come back to, to why that's important in a minute. In panel B, we look on the, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see, um, uh, a, a dot that's underneath, um, that's above the word primary. And, and all of these dots with the, with the um, lines through them represent different land uses. And as you go from left to right, what we're doing is we're moving from more natural through to much more human dominated land uses. And so this, this graph is showing how, how species richness on average is changing. And so what we're seeing is that um, across all these different sites that you see in the map above, so this is across the whole world, we're seeing a decrease in the number of species. So for any, any one of these sites, if you converted it from a more natural to a more human dominated site, what we see is a in general, there's a decrease in the number of species. And so if we look in panel C in the top right hand side, what, what we're looking at there is the total number of individuals. So what we see is a reduction in the total number of uh, individual animals uh, in these different land uses. So 
the, the general response of biodiversity to these large ongoing changes to the way people are using land is that we're seeing a reduction in the number of, of species and individuals. So what, what, what about zoonotic diseases? But this is a, a paper from 2014 by Catherine Smith and colleagues. And, and what they've done is tried to look at how the number of uh, human disease outbreaks is changing over time. And if we look at the big red arrow that I put in, um, what we're looking at there is the total number of known zoonotic diseases. And so what we're seeing actually is an increase. So if, if wildlife's a key component and we're seeing a, de a decline generally, why are we then seeing an increase in uh, in, in, zoo, in zoonotic diseases. So this could be to do with we're just better at detecting them. So, so that might be one, one uh, reason. But if we think about that, if we look at very large outbreaks, which are generally well detected, you know, we, people very rarely miss a huge global pandemic as, as, as we know. Well, these, these large outbreak events seem to be increasing in frequency. So not only do we have this idea that maybe outbreaks of all sizes are increasing, but there seems to be an apparent increase in the frequency of, of larger outbreaks. And this obviously doesn't contain the, the COVID-19. So to, to, to try and work out why that might be happening, I'm going to use a couple of different case studies. So I want everyone, some people might be there already, but to transport themselves to uh, northeastern the United States and into the, the deciduous forest there. And what we have in, in these forests is we have um, groups, of, uh, a community of, of, of mammals. And so the mammals in those, uh, in, in this community uh, um, exist, as, as we can see with some of uh, Tim Newbold's work, in this kind of very intact system, it's going to look quite different to a more degraded version of of, of that system where there's, that it's being used for, as either a plantation or for sort of human uses. And so what we're, what we're seeing here is, is that um, in, in a degraded landscape, uh, we, we, we're going to see in general, um, a loss of things like large bodied animals that need a, a lot of space and, um, and particular animal species that are very, um, intolerant of people. And so <clears throat> one of the uh, critters that you have uh, in this uh, woodland system are ticks. Ticks uh, spend their time, um, you know, hanging around on, on, on vegetation and, and waiting for um, uh, a mammal to walk past and it uh, will drop on them and then start feeding. And so some animals are much better at uh, getting rid of these ticks are much better at um, not having them. So what this brings us to is this idea called dilution effect. So in the bottom of the um, graph here, we've got, uh, we've got sort of uh, forest, um, forest cover. So on, on the right hand side, we've got a very completely intact forest. And on the left hand side, we've got an almost completely depleted forest. And if we just concentrate on the right hand side, what, what we're seeing is that uh, the dilution effect is, is one where uh, it says in very biodiverse forested areas, what we have are animals of all different competence at carrying uh, uh, ticks and, and therefore giving Lyme disease to people. So, so Lyme disease is a bacteria that, that exists inside the, the ticks. And that, and that when, when the tick bites uh, either a person or an animal, it can then spread into that, the, the body and then reproduce. And then next time it gets bitten, it then gets uh, transported. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the idea is in these very biodiverse areas, you've got species that have very mixed tolerances. But as you move to this more medium habitat, what we end up with is actually we filter down to 
species that actually are just very good at having ticks and passing them on. And so what we see here is in the left hand side, a very biodiverse area it has possums, it has deer and it has mice. Mice are very good at passing on um, the, the, the ticks and, and carrying ticks that have disease. And here it's diluted. You, if you go walk around, you're, you're likely to bump into a deer or a possum. But on the other side, you, you, you're mainly going to meet mice. So there's this idea that actually uh, the, the intact uh, habitats are actually buffering your contact with disease carrying species. And that's, uh, and by reducing the intact habitats, that's why you're seeing an increase in zoonotic outbreaks. So my next example is, is sort of moving to Southeast Asia and looking at um, the um, tiger mosquito. And so what, one of the things that we see in Southeast Asia is in a, a huge increase in, in urban areas and in urbanization. And um, here we've got China increasing very rapidly um, with India keeping pace with the rest of the world, but we're seeing an increase in urbanization. So we're end, we end up seeing uh, natural habitats converted into uh, more urban habitats. And one of the things that the tiger mosquito is very good at is existing in just these types of habitats. Whereas some mosquito species need um, forests or they, they like to live in, in particular plants in rainforests, these, uh, these uh, mosquitoes, which carry the, the dengue virus, are, are very happy to live in these kind of conditions. So the increasing urbanization, is what we're doing is we're increasing the, the suitable habitat for the tiger mosquito. And then that, what, what we're seeing then, for instance, here is, is a paper looking um, uh, in a particular province in China. And what this is showing in the, in the central area is in red, we see urban areas and highly populated areas. What we see is where you have urban and highly populated areas, we have above, in the top row, large numbers of uh, uh, dengue fever cases. And, and this, this mosquito is so capable of living with people that, that we see um, that they can also start using transport systems. Any pocket of water that's, that's anywhere along a road can be, can be used. And so this, this kind of urban loving species that carry diseases and this massive increase in urbanization, that's, that's another, maybe another reason why we're seeing uh, increases in, um, in zoonotic disease outbreaks. And so kind of one of the last things I want to talk about is, is uh, kind of agricultural areas. Um, and for instance, this uh, uh, area for, that's being used for grazing and uh, Lassa fever, which is a disease that I've personally worked on. And so that, that's, uh, the dots that we can see on the map are where we have had lesser outbreaks. On the left-hand side is the rodent that passes this disease onto people. And also on the left-hand side, we can see the kind of landscapes, these kind of agricultural, um, rural uh, village landscapes where mastomis does very, very well. And so in West Africa, we're seeing a huge increase in population. Uh, in the dotted line. And then in the solid blue line, we're seeing uh, a, a con concomitant kind of increase in food production. And so as we are trying to meet that need, the, the food need of that larger population, this map goes increasingly yellow over time. So from 1975, 2000, 2013, we see this increase in yellow and yellow is cropland. And what we're seeing is this huge conversion to cropland area. And as we've said before, Mastomis natalensis, which carries Lassa fever, it does very, very well in, in, in cropland areas. As soon as you have some cropland, they will move in. And you're then going to see, we're going to be boosting the amount of food we have. We're going to increase food security in the region to feed those people. But at the same time, what we see here is, um, and, and these columns are different potential future uh, scenarios of um, of land use change, what we're seeing is an increase in less of predicted numbers of Lassa fever cases. And so this is a paper that, Ro that Rory, who will be speaking later, is working on. And so the, the cost of this increased food security is increasing numbers 
of disease cases. So there's these trade-offs, these really important trade-offs between um, health and, and sort of other really important ways that the land can to meet our needs. But it's a question of trying to think carefully about how these things might interact. And so what's the future? You know, I've, I've used a couple of, of, of case studies to think about why we are potentially seeing some of these kind of increasing numbers of, of outbreaks. Well, one thing we can do is to start thinking more holistically. So thinking about the kind of food security, but also thinking about the sort of biodiversity angle. So there's this idea of kind of one health or planetary health, which are these ideas that we can actually uh, think about all of these things together. And actually by promoting them all, we can actually, we can actually find these kind of win-win situations. And so this is kind of leading on to some of the work um, that uh, Susan Sokolow, or Sokolow, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, has, been, has been doing, which I think is a, a really great body of work where, where she's been looking, um, her and her colleagues, obviously there's lots of uh, authors on these papers, but um, has been looking at how you can actually find uh, these, these kind of win-win situations. So we've got here, uh, a shrimp, it's the wrong species, but it was the best picture I could find. And um, a very similar species to this in uh, Africa, where we see um, a that if you dam that area, these species can no longer survive. And the, the snail that then gives people human schist schistosomiasis then proliferates, and we get these large numbers of, of disease cases. So by thinking about the, the health by the biodiversity of the, of the system um, and, and actually restoring the, um, the rivers, uh, then we actually see a reduction in, in numbers of disease cases. And similarly, another paper that's just come out, um, again, by a large group of authors, um, just come out in October, is looking at how uh, you can actually improve people's lives um, and actually that reduces the amount of logging and conserves um, forest areas such that they are sort of more intact. So there's kind of thinking more holistically, thinking about all these different elements and um, how we can kind of bring them together to, to try and benefit both the needs of people, meet the needs of people and benefit the planet. Okay, thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dave, for that talk and also for the examples that you gave too. We have had some questions through already from viewers, but I'm just going to remind everyone, if you haven't already, how you can ask your questions to Dave and the rest of tonight's speakers. You can do this by either going to pigeonhole.at forward slash 1960 to ask your own question or to upvote other people's questions or you can send us an email uh, to scientific.events at zsl.org. As I mentioned, Dave, we have had a few questions through already on pigeonhole um, and the most popular question, and I'm, I'm not sure whether you're in a position to answer this or not, um, but the most popular question is, is there any analysis of how different places rank in terms of disease risk um, as a result of habitat loss? Are you aware of, of any analysis of that kind? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly there are. Um... There's, there's definitely uh, people have looked at this sort of thing. So um, uh, Professor Kate Jones at uh, UCL has uh, did a, a paper in 2008 that's um, one of the most highly cited in this area. And that's kind of looking at um, how diseases emerge. So trying to understand the, the different drivers at a global level that are causing uh, diseases uh, to, to start appearing effectively. Uh, and so that kind of looked at things like uh, the total number of species um, in the area and also the number of the amount of people there. So that's the sort of one index of how disturbed an area might be is that, you know, the, the, the number of people. But um, th there's also work by Chris Murray and colleagues kind of looking at, um, at some, you know, kind of follow up to, to some of these, um, these, these questions. So there's definitely you know, work going on. Um, 
you know, I think I think also, you know, trying to try think of some others like Bar Barbara Han uh, has also been kind of looking at some of these uh, sort of global patterns. So yeah, there there is work. Definitely, that, that's that's something that we, we do need to think about. Some of the work that I've done is kind of looked at some case studies such as Lassa fever and Ebola and, and tried to look at how um, sort of current conditions and our kind of future progression of, of, of climate and land use change is likely to impact um, sort of, you know, cases. And so it's, it's definitely works ongoing and I think it's, it's really important to, to carry on doing that. Fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Well, some good good names there for, for people to look up if, if that's an area they'd like to find out more about. Um, I'll also ask you one more question before we move on to um, the other speakers. Uh, and that's actually relating to One Health that you mentioned uh, in your, your talk. Um, and the question here from Peter, he mentions that One Health is an approach embraced by the scientific community, but uh, he feels it's not doesn't necessarily always seem to be understood by politicians and government departments. And he wonders how you disseminate um, many of the findings that you're discussing tonight to these politicians and, and governments. You know, how, how do you start to, to help them to understand the importance of, of this concept of One Health? Okay, I feel like I have to tread sort of lightly here because I think there's, there's a lot of um, in interest in, in cut a different kind of approaches that are trying to integrate science with with policy so there's planetary health and one health which are two big pushes i think to try to bridge that gap and it's an ongoing challenge you know how do we move from these kind of uh you know scientific studies that are, are trying to show how things are probably going to change over time under these particular conditions how do we move to actually saying to politicians do this do this one simple thing and, and so that, that's a continual challenge. And, and, and I think that's the, one of the aims of, of, of things like One Health, you know, this idea that let's work, let's prioritize all these things and it's gonna benefit us, but it's actually convincing people that that's the case. So getting the kind of um, political kind of leverage. Uh, and I think uh, we're in a really different situation now. And I think we need to readdress mm -hmm. what the political will is now as a result of, of the COVID uh, 19 pandemic because I think there's been a huge sort of sudden interest how long term it is is uh, it, it, it remains to be seen so I think we have to be a little bit circumspect at this point and and think and, and actually try really hard to engage um, in, in effective ways um, and I think that's about creating making simple messages and showing these kind of win-win the benefits in terms of, of understandable units like um, how much money you're going to save, how many lives you're going to save, you know, these kind of really basic things that people can understand rather than some log odds ratio or something which scientists tend to talk in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, um, the questions are coming through thick and fast, so do keep them coming, everyone. I'm now going to hand over to, to Dave to introduce the rest of this evening's speakers. Okay. Thanks a lot. So next up is, is Dr. Rory Gibb, who is a research fellow at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, or Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and um, he has just uh, finished his PhD at UCL with um, Kate Jones, uh, Professor Kate Jones, who I mentioned earlier, and his work kind of con concentrates on uh, land use change and sort of global change and how it might be impacting uh, the communities of animals that carry diseases. Okay, over to you, Rory. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. There we go. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see that. Um, thank you so much for the invite to speak. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, my name's Rory. I'm a postdoc, um, and my research is focused on understanding really how environmental changes are impacting um, the epidemiology and the risks of zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. Um, so yeah, I'm currently based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, but the work that I'm going to be talking about now was done when I was at University College London for my PhD. And so the focus of what I'm going to be talking about is kind of picking up from where Dave left off, really, um, and on understanding how zoonotic host communities or reservoir species respond to human transformation to the landscape in ways that could influence disease risk. 
So what do I mean when I talk about zoonotic host communities? So zoonotic pathogens and parasites are maintained within uh, animal reservoir communities. So you can see here on the slide, we've got some idealized community of species in the environment, which these pathogens are circulating in. And what happens is that when humans come into contact with these communities, the pathogens can spill over, they can make the jump into human populations. And some, in some cases, those pathogens will then be effective at transmitting onward through the human population. So we can think about COVID as a really good example here, right? Um, but for the most part, what we find is that zoonoses are generally not very good at transmitting onwards for long, kind of long periods of time through people. So when we want to understand what's driving the risk of zoonoses, we really need to be thinking about what's driving human host contact. What are the processes that are creating these contact points? And in turn, because of the way that these human and wildlife systems are coupled, in order to understand what's shaping those risks, we need to understand how human pressures and environmental pressures are influencing those host communities. So this includes things like climate change and climate seasonality. Uh, but for today, I'm picking up from where Dave left off, I'm going to be talking about land use change. So obviously, this is a, a really profound impact on ecosystems worldwide. So this map of the global human footprint on ecosystems shows in red areas where humans are having a, a clear and measurable impact on the Earth's terrestrial surface. So the clear take home here is that most of the Earth's surface is impacted by, by humans, much of it due to agriculture. And a consequent, one of the questions here is what's the consequence kind of both overall and in terms of um, changes to the kind of- Sorry, Rory, can I just interrupt really quickly? You're, we yeah, can sure. see the notes on your, on your slide <laughs> if you want to switch to- Yeah, sure. Okay, um, brilliant. Hopefully that's not been there the whole time, but if it has, I apologize all. Um, so yeah, um, what we need to do is really understand how these changes to landscapes are impacting zoonotic host communities. But in order to do that, we need to go out and measure them. So here is a, an idealized ecological community um, somewhere in Brazil. Um, and what we can see in this box is these dots, each one of these represents an animals and the colors of these dots represent species. And so if we want to understand what species are out there in the environment, we need to go and survey them, right? So we go out and we catch some stuff, we identify it, we count it, we measure it. And ecosystems are really complex and, and difficult to summarize. But we can come up with some kind of simple summary metrics, which tell us something useful about, uh, about what's going on in this ecosystem, right? So we can say that this ecosystem has a species richness of five, or five species, and a total abundance of 25 individuals. But what we're really interested in is how are these communities responding to changes to land use? And so in order to do that, we need to have some kind of baseline to compare to. And so what we can do is use the same methods to go out and survey across a gradient of, of land use types that are experiencing different levels of human disturbance. So we can start on the left here in our least disturbed primary vegetation. So we go out and we survey and we find we've got five species and a total abundance of 25. And then we can go into secondary vegetation. So here we have, this is vegetation that's natural vegetation, but it's recovering from recent human disturbance. And here we've lost a species and we've lost, but we've got a similar kind of abundance. And then we can go and survey in some actively managed human landscapes. So agriculture and plantations. And here we've lost some more species and the abundance is declining. And finally, we can go and sample in a city, one of the most kind of disturbed environments you can have. And we find again that we've lost some species and we've lost abundance. So this is a kind of an idealized example of what happens to biodiversity as you're moving along this, this pressure gradient. And if we want to understand how this plays out globally, what we can do is basically take loads of examples of, people, of where people have done this kind of study, combine them all together and kind of average them out. And so what we see when we do that, and this is the study actually that, that Dave mentioned earlier, it's a Newbold study where we, they've compiled these um, these sites from more than 11,000 sites worldwide is that effectively species richness declines pretty consistently as you move into these more um, agricultural and urban habitats. So as we move away from the primary land baseline, which we can see on the left of this graph here, into these progressively more disturbed habitats. But this kind of picture of biodiversity overall doesn't give us the full picture because ecosystems are complex. And if we actually look at this example that I provided here of different, um, of different ecosystems under disturbance, 
we can see that actually the species losses aren't universal. So not all species are disappearing and some are doing better than others. So on the one hand, we can see that the red and the green species are gradually dropping out as we move into the most disturbed land uses. So an example of a species like this might be something like the colobus monkey, which tends to be quite sensitive to human impacts and found in less disturbed forest. And there are certain traits that predict whether species are likely to, to respond like this. So they often live at low population densities, they're slow to reproduce, they have relatively narrow geographical ranges. And on the other hand, if we look in our kind of urban and agricultural ecosystem, we can see that actually the pale blue and the yellow species are, are in fact doing really well, they're persisting or flourishing. And so an example of a species like this might be the brown rat. So these are species that live at naturally high population densities often, they reproduce quickly, they have wide geographical ranges. And so the question here really is, what do these kinds of uneven and, and kind of non-random filtering effects on biodiversity, what do they mean and do they mean anything for zoonotic disease spillover risk? And there's a reason to think they might do because a lot of these traits that predict whether species are more likely to persist are often things that are associated with, with being more likely to carry zoonotic pathogens. And so what we were interested in doing was finding out, you know, play out, to, so effectively do hosts respond differently in some way than biodiversity overall. And so what we did was to take the same database that was used for Tim's study earlier, so this huge database where people have gone out worldwide and sampled across all these gradients of disturbance, and rather than just looking at biodiversity overall, what we do is we identify those species in the community, which you can see in this box ringed in red, that we know are, are as reservoirs of zoonotic pathogens, so pathogens that can infect people. Um, and then what we can do is effectively compare the responses of those species to the responses of biodiversity overall, which we consider to be non-hosts, and ask, are hosts doing something different? And when we do that, what we find is, is a really interesting result, right? So what these graphs show, firstly on the left, is the proportion of the total species richness in the community that's taken up by host species. And on the right, the proportion of the total abundance, so the total number of individuals in the community that's taken up by host species. As we move from primary minimal use um, landscapes on the far left, through progressively more disturbed landscapes as we move rightward on the graph. And if we're above the line, we're increasing. And if we're below the line, we're decreasing. And so what we see the kind of key take home here is that as we move into more intensely used landscapes, both within and between kind of categories of land use, we see this kind of increasing shift towards communities that are dominated by um, zoonotic host species, the so species that can transmit pathogens to people. So there's some kind of systematic filtering effect going on here in these ecosystems where we're, we're losing um, the non-host species and those species that are more likely to transmit pathogens to people tend to persist. But if we dig into this more in more detail, what we can see is that actually these effects aren't universal among different types of species that are more likely to transmit um, pathogens to people. So what these graphs are showing um, is something similar to in the previous slide, where along uh, the x-axis, what we can see is different land use types are secondary managed and urban. And what our points and error bars are showing is effectively the average response of species, um, the, the average change in abundance of those species as we move away from primary undisturbed habitat into these progressively more disturbed land uses. And what we do is we partition this out among host species and non-host species. So hosts in brown, non-hosts in green. And so the kind of key take home here really is that actually what kind of species group you're in matters. So we see this kind of very clear divergent response um, in, in terms of abundance between host and non-host species within these, these orders uh, for passerine birds and for bats and for rodents. So as you're moving into more human dominated landscapes, this filtering effect is really strong and we're left with communities dominated by hosts. Whereas in contrast, if we look at primates and carnivores, we see pretty similar responses to land use regardless of whether you're a host or not. And so what this means is that we're likely to see different kind of types of landscapes being potentially riskier for, for contact with different kinds of host communities and different kinds of diseases. So for example, we might be more likely to come into contact with primates and carnivores in these kind of more mosaic, partly disturbed, partly edge habitats. Whereas maybe we're more likely to encounter rodents in these more, more intensely kind of agricultural or urban systems. So what does this mean for disease risk to wrap up? 
So what we show here is that there's strong evidence that land use is having these kind of global, general, kind of predictable effects on, on zoonotic host communities as we're moving into more disturbed land use types. And we can think about this as being an important contributor to the kind of hazard for zoonotic spillover. But if we want to understand how risks play out, we also need to understand what are the factors that are influencing people's exposure and their vulnerability to these hazards. I think kind of moving beyond this ecological only perspective, what we need to think about is what are the kind of socioeconomic factors that are creating exposures and vulnerabilities to these kind of hazards that are changing systematically worldwide. So um, yeah, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, thanks to my co-authors and to UCL for funding this. Thanks very much, Rory. That was a really great talk. Um, very clear, which was really brilliant. So um, just having a quick look at some of the questions coming up. Uh, let me just have a quick look. So just in the meantime, just uh, a question I was thinking of, you know, is there, what, what can we do? Is there, is there any sort of take homes in terms of how, of how we should sort of move forward in the future in terms of landscapes? You know, is there some things that we can do uh, to try and to try and prevent um, or try and help human health in the future. So I guess one thing that I, I feel like this kind of result speaks slightly to is this question about how intensely we use landscapes. Um, so what we see quite clearly is quite a strong effect of, of land use intensity on this filtering effect. So even if you're in an agricultural landscape, if you, the landscape is being used kind of less intensely, the filtering effect is less strong. So I think this raises some interesting questions about how it is that we can kind of design landscapes in ways that um, kind of help to preserve the kind of natural regulatory functions of ecosystems and biodiversity and kind of help keep those populations um, kind of of hosts in check. Um, so, you know, like I suppose speaking to your point about um, food security, you know, it's like kind of how can we ensure food security while also kind of helping to regulate these populations naturally, I think is a a really important question for the future. Um, okay, so so leading on from that, we've got a question about um, food security. It says, is there an example that you know of where holistic thinking has been achieved to ensure food security and biodiversity security at the same time? Obviously, if you don't don't know, don't you know? Just... That's a good question. There are a lot of examples of it, and none kind of specifically springs to mind. I think there's one example from a disease risk perspective, which is actually the work that you referred to of, of Suzanne Sokolow and, and some of that group that have been trying to think holistically about how you maintain kind of riverine ecosystems in ways that regulate disease risk while also providing food security because you can, um, you can uh, raise these prawns in aquaculture and, and use them as a food source and also use them as a, as a kind of an economic product. So these are the kinds of, I suppose, sort of planetary health and one health focus solutions that are thinking about how you achieve kind of net benefits to all sorts of different kind of ecological outputs. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a huge area and I think there are many examples of where people are trying to reconcile food security with biodiversity conservation more broadly as well. Okay, great. And a lot, one final question is, um, is there, sorry, is there a correlation between more resistant or tolerant animal species and the occurrence of pathogens? <laughs> So that's a good question. And I think it's a really, um, it's still quite an open question, I think, in this field. Um, and it speaks a bit to the dilution effect stuff that you were talking about earlier. Um, so there's kind of a lot of discussion around kind of the role of different species um, abilities to host pathogens um, and kind of what we call competence. Um, and what kind of aspects of, of species make them more likely to, ho uh, to make them better hosts of pathogens. I think there's kind of on the one side, there's people that think that fast living species are very good at kind of hosting pathogens because you're constantly re replenishing your population and living at high density so pathogens can spread really well. On the other hand, you've got long lived species that can kind of persist with these pathogens and transmit them among themselves very slowly so the pathogens are more likely to persist. And I think it's still an open question about what kinds of species we eat. Um, need to be thinking about in terms of what kinds of risks. Um, and I think the short answer is that it's probably likely to be quite context dependent a lot of the time. I think these kinds of general analyses can get us so far. And then you get to the point where you, you know, you start really needing to think about what are the kind of context specificities to your particular disease you're interested in, um, in terms of managing that risk. Great. Well, 
thank you very much for mm. that. That was great. Um, okay, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Christina Faust. Um, Chris, uh, Christina is a research scholar at the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics at Penn State University. She, her research focuses on environmental change and infectious disease, uh, disease dynamics, um, particularly looking at human and domestic animal diseases. So uh, thanks very much uh, for coming and I'm, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everyone. I, like Dave said, I'm going to be talking to you today about some of my research um, and kind of generally what we think about um, when we think about land use change. So this image has been on all the promotional material, so hopefully you've seen it before, but it's one of my favorite images. Um, it's taken from a satellite um, run by Planet Labs, but it's in the Amazon rainforest and it clearly shows how protected areas can help preserve this natural habitat. Um, and on the other side, you have a very human, intense landscape um, that's intensely managed for agriculture, but, but human density is relatively low there. Um, so um, this is the case in the Amazon, but we also have this occurring around the globe. So this is an, an analysis um, using satellite imagery at a 30 meter resolution of forest cover around the globe. So in green areas, we have areas that are still heavily intact. Um, forest ecosystems. And in pink, we have areas that have lost forest in the last few decades, but also gained. And in red, we have a net loss. So you can see that forest loss is occurring around the globe, and it's pretty um, ubiquitously occurring in all ecosystems. I would like to say that a lot of these purple areas, especially in Southeast Asia, um, are actually regenerating into plantations which have lower um, biodiversity value. And, and Kim will be talking about that next. Um, so why do we care about forest um, cover change or land use change? We've heard many really nice examples from Dave and Rory, um, but I'm gonna be focusing on this interface and how this land use change um, changes contacts between two different species. So there's been lots of examples um, over time about how conversion of one habitat to another um, can lead to spillover of new pathogens. So Ebola has already been mentioned, and this often occurs when humans move into forested ecosystems and either contact infected carcasses or um, harvest meat or some other contact mechanism. But we can also spread diseases to animals in natural habitats as well. And a prime example of this is humans giving measles to mountain gorillas um, in Central Africa, which has been recorded many times. And when we think about humans converting landscapes, we not only fill those landscapes with ourselves, but domestic animals, which has been mentioned. And this has been implicated in the spillover of canine distemper virus into carnivores and Serengeti. So they get it from contact with domestic dogs in those human dominated landscapes. Um, and as Kim will talk about in a bit um, and was mentioned earlier with dengue, we can have mosquitoes moving pathogens across these different landscapes as well. So there's lots of um, contact that's facilitated between these two landscapes and, and disease transmission that can occur. So I'm gonna go back to another aerial photo. This time we're in um, uh, Ecuador actually. Um, and you can see that there's a forested landscape. And as Rory mentioned, these normally have really nice high levels of biodiversity and also high levels of abundance of certain species. Then we also have these human dominated landscapes which support both human populations, but also domestic animals. And what we've been trying to look at is this edge. So this, this interface between the human dominated landscapes and forest and what this can tell us about transmission and maybe be used as a nice proxy because we can measure these edge habitats and they're quite predictable in how we start changing landscapes um, in many areas of the globe. So I'm gonna show some modeling, some theoretical work, but I'll, I'll also back it up with some case studies as well. 
So this is just a very kind of toy model that we have, but if we can think about on the bottom habitat being converted. So in all my slides, green is natural habitat and we're moving towards this tan or human dominated landscape. And we think about these as um, not as urban habitats, but more as like a mosaic agriculture. So it still supports biodiversity, but has more humans. And so all of these plots along the horizontal axis will have proportion habitat converted. So on the left-hand side, we have a lot more natural habitat. And on the right-hand side, we have mostly human habitat. And kind of generally, we think about these, the amount of host or animal wildlife host um, declining as we go across this gradient. But Rory talked about examples where this is not the case. Um, and then, but also along this gradient, we have human population density increasing or domestic animal density increasing. And th this is important to think about as well as we convert more habitat, we have more and more people um, in that habitat to become infected. And both of these things are occurring on a monotonic um, platform. So they're only increasing or only decreasing. Um, but interestingly, the edge or that interface between the two habitats is non-monotonic, which is just a fancy word for saying it increases and then it decreases. Um, and we think this has interesting implications for transmission. Um, so if we think about contact between these two hosts being maximal at this intermediate um, level, and we can kind of simulate an epidemic in this, in this kind of imaginary world and think about when outbreaks are going to be common. And so on this plot, again, the horizontal axis is the same as I've showed before, but on, along the vertical axis, we're looking at probability of a human infection. So this is thinking about in a given year, what's the likelihood that you'll have a single human infection. And in this case, this, this is parameterized. So it's, it's modeled to be Ebola basically, um, and a Ugandan strain. So what we see is that as we start converting habitat, we quickly see an increase in risk of human cases of Ebola. Um, and then as we move towards the edge, we actually see a rapid decline. And this is because the number of hosts that are kind of reservoirs for this disease are really rapidly declining. And we can also think about in addition to whether or not we'll get a spillover is how big that outbreak would be. Um, so this is, um, we can simulate this many times um, and then measure what the outbreak size is. And what we interestingly see is that the outbreak, the highest outbreaks are actually occurring at this lag end. Um, and this is because the amount of humans that are in that habitat is much greater than in these lower habitats. So although the, the probability of an outbreak is lower when it does occur, there's a lot of human to human transmission that occurs. Um, and why that's important is because the size of that initial outbreak is also important for the spatial spread um, of that disease. So, so it could lead to larger outbreaks like the West African outbreak in 2016. So both of these things are important to think about. Um, this is an example that's just using a slice of kind of a, a, across space, but we can vary how much is deforested each year, how much land is converted each year and, and how that changes through time. So, so these different plots are showing different um, amounts of conversion. And then the thickness of the line is how much land is converted in that one instance. And again, um, green here is our animal population um, or non-human animal population and, and brown is the human population. And what we see is once we start seeing conversion, we see actually an increase in prevalence um, over time. This actually does dip down in some of the different conversion regimes over time. I'd be happy to talk about why that is. Um, but this is just to emphasize that the size and the timing of conversion is also important for spillover dynamics. So these are all models. Um, is this true? So there's several examples we have where disease systems um, or human risk is actually highest at intermediate level of conversion. One example is um, Chagas disease, which is caused by a trypanosome parasite, Trypanosoma cruzii, and this occurs throughout Central and South America. And there's some really nice examples of 
where you get highest human risk is actually at these habitats that are marginally converted and close to some very extensive forested areas. Um, Borrelia ulcer is this mycobacterium. Um, it's transmitted by water bugs and stream systems. And they also find that intermediate levels of conversion. So you still have to have certain members in the habitat present. We do get highest infection risk to humans. And then another example, which were probably, uh, these are flying foxes, so bats um, carrying HANIPA viruses. So this is in Central Africa that they found humans that lived in villages that had recently deforested a bit around their village had the highest prevalence of, of serology for HANIPA viruses, which suggested they had higher exposure rates. And, and Kim will talk about some more exciting examples next. Um, and when I give this talk, I often have to caution people that uh, converting all the habitat is not the solution. Um, so Hendra virus has a really nice example. So Hendra virus is a bat virus that normally, or a virus that normally circulates in bats in Eastern Australia. And these bats feed mostly on nectar and pollen from eucalypt species. Um, that's down below, that's, that's a eucalypt flowering event. However, the last century has led to massive loss of their own eucalypt habitat, and these bats have actually moved into urban areas. So they reside in camps or, or large roosts in urban areas and feed off of um, invasive species and also backyard fruit trees, which decreases their nutrition and immunity and actually increases their likelihood of um, shedding virus which we think in turn has led to the increase in human cases that we've seen over the last 20 years. So this is just a map of Eastern Australia and the bats actually occur across Eastern Australia and the highest amount of bats is actually away from human habitats. But in white, we can see the spillover events and these are concentrated in human um, centric areas and, and it has to go through a horse host. There's some complications about it, but I'd be happy to talk about it later. So I don't want to end on a bad note. Um, there's many things we can do to kind of promote this one health approach. And, and these protected areas we think are incredibly essential for maintaining biodiversity and high quality habitat and reducing carbon consumption so we can reduce land use change and also advocate for kind of science-based decision making, which some people have brought up. And with that, there's many people to thank. And if you're interested in Bat One Health or, or this kind of Hendra virus, you can check out their website. Um, and there's many people that have been involved over the years with this. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Christina. That was a brilliant talk um, of one of my favorite papers of recent times, I have to say. Um, so, uh, okay. So just having a look at some of the questions that are coming in. Um, uh, some of the things that I was interested in was, um, and I don't know whether it's, it's that easy to answer as a question, but I was thinking about um, whether there's kind of different pathogens that might uh, be being passed on at different levels of conversion, whether there's kind of characteristics. So, so I'm kind of thinking that in areas that have been converted for quite a long time, we may be looking at kind of endemic, kind of chronic um uh sort of diseases i don't know whether you've sort of thought about yeah so to... i think it's gonna heavily depend on kind of yeah the lifespan of the pathogen if it's a chronic infection so this is a pathogen that's always going to be in reservoir host species and whether it can have an environmental stage so so a lot of these nematodes or parasitic worms that we have can actually have a stable environmental stage so we can have time lags. So when you convert a landscape rapidly, you might have kind of a bolster of a reservoir host that's actually putting out lots of parasites and then you could have a carry on effect. I think I'm gonna go with Rory and that a lot of these are gonna be context dependent, but I do think there's a lot to learn about parasite life histories and, and, and what's needed, um, how long their generation times are and how stable they are in the environment to be able to inform a little bit more of this temporal and spatial variation. So, yeah. Um, so a question that's come in um, that I guess you sort, sort of uh, is, is what you've been talking about. It says, um, how do we counter keeping hosts 
in check through well-considered land use management. Uh, so, so then they go on to talk about urban centres are going to become more important as global population builds. So this is kind of thinking, I guess, how, how is fragmentation, how do we manage fragmentation and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think, well, there, there's kind of two sides of the coin, right? In that some hosts thrive in, in natural environments, but as Rory mentioned, some hosts thrive in urban environments. And I, there is a move to kind of um, manage hosts in a way that, that we can improve their health. So there's transmissible vaccines that we have for vampire bat rabies that we can employ. So there's treatment options for hosts and learning to kind of how to manage pathogens within those host populations. But I think for a lot of diseases, we don't yet have the full toolkit to be able to help manage disease within the host. We do know that healthy host is better for our health as well. Um, so that improving immune systems in hosts can also have knockdown effects for us. But yeah, it's, yeah, I don't think that answered the question completely, but <laughs> I think if you ask anyone that's tried to control any rodents um, in an urban setting, it's nearly impossible. Um, so yeah, yeah. certainly it's um, <laughs> definitely you're left with some very difficult to control animals, I think, as, as you develop the landscape into sort of more human dominated landscapes. OK, just have a, a quick look. Um, I, say, I guess this kind of question also really has just been answered, but should we then target active man management against certain species that increase risk? Yeah, so I think especially, so in Eastern Australia with, with bats, the, the target is actually now to restore their natural habitat and draw them out of these urban centers. So they're adaptable and they can move into urban centers, but it's not ideal for both sites, both humans and the animals. So active restoration is actually probably the best tool they have to control, manage that, that particular host. So I think it is an option as we learn more and more, um, but it will definitely depend on the disease system. Yeah, I don't quite know how, what we do with black rats really, and how we draw them back to wherever <laughs> they came from. But. Um, okay, well, thanks very much, Christina. That was a great talk. Um, so, so, our next speaker is Dr. Kimberly Fornace, um, who is an assistant professor of, at uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which I've said correctly this time. Her work is mainly looks at the effects of landscapes on infectious diseases. Um, and some of her work, I think, is, is, is kind of what some of the things that I was trying to allude to of how we can kind of think more holistically and, and think in a kind of working in, in a multidisciplinary way. So it's um, very exciting to hear what she's been doing. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so. Right, so just um, while I'm waiting for my screen to share. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different take um, from everyone else, and I'm going to talk about a very specific research project. Um, so this was the Monkey Bar Research Project, which was a collaboration between Asia, the Philippines, the UK, and Australia, which was really looking at this relationship between deforestation and zoonotic malaria in Asia. Um, Right, so just as a bit of background, this is looking at Plasmodium nolsi. Um, so Plasmodium nolsi is a malaria parasite, which is typically carried by long-tailed and pig-tailed macaques. Like all human malarias, this is transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. So human cases of Plasmodium nolsi occur when a mosquito bites an infected macaque and then goes on to bite a person. Um, this is an important public health issue, so this can cause severe malaria and death in people. And what's a particular concern is there's increasing numbers of human cases which are reported across Southeast Asia. So Plasmodium nolsi is now the main cause of malaria in Malaysia. Um, and there are several thousand cases reported every year. And so while this is an emerging disease, this is not a new disease. It, nolsi was first discovered in 1932 in macaques. And the very first naturally acquired human case of Nolsi was identified in 1965 in a person. Um, but 
there was very little evidence that this was actually a substantial public health issue. Um, so no other human cases were reported until 2004. And in 2004, colleagues working in Malaysia and Borneo used improved diagnostics to show that a large number of human malaria cases were in fact plasmodium nolsi. And since 2004, plasmodium nolsi has been reported all across Southeast Asia. So there's quite a wide distribution and these numbers have increased substantially since this map was made. But I think what's quite notable is that despite this wide geographic spread, there are substantial differences in the numbers of cases reported in different locations. So Malaysia has the highest number of plasmodium nolsi cases reported in the world. And the particular focus of this is in this island of Borneo. So if we overlay this map deforestation, what is immediately obvious is that these areas that have some of the highest rates of deforestation also are reporting some of the highest rates of plasmodium nolsi. So when we started this project, one of the first things we wanted to, to do was to um, look at the relationship between forest cover and plasmodium nolsi incidence. And one of the questions we wanted to, to answer is nolsi incidence associated with deforestation, or is this really you know, effective now that we know nolsi is here? The more we look at it, the more we actually find it. And so to do this, we did a retrospective review of hospital-based reports and fit some models to estimate village level nolsi incidence, adjusting for some of these issues around reporting and diagnostic sensitivity. We then integrated this with a number of different environmental variables, looking at deforestation, forest cover, and other metrics. And what we find is the answer is yes, there is a very strong association between plasmodium nolsi and deforestation. So these villages, which are reporting some of the highest numbers of plasmodium nolsi cases, are areas where there's ongoing deforestation. Um, but notably, as Christine has already explained, um, these are areas that are not just deforested, but these are areas that have both forest cover and forest lodge loss, so these very patchy, fragmented landscapes. The next question we really tried to answer is why. So what are the mechanisms that underlie why these particular landscapes are associated with risk? And so if we think about this really quite simplistically, thinking about these different populations that are implicated in plasmodium nolsi transmission, we know that we have people that are living in villages and moving into farms and forest landscapes. We know we have macaques that are living in forests, moving into farms and often into villages. And we have different numbers and densities of mosquito vector species, which are living across all of these different habitats. So we hypothesized that deforestation was really driving these, was driving plasmodium nolsi incidence by increasing the proximity of these different populations. So really bringing these populations that were previously separated together. And so one of the first steps to actually seeing this is looking at where deforestation is occurring. So I think we've already seen some very nice examples of using satellite data, and we used a number of different sources of satellite data to monitor deforestation and landscape. But as well, in addition to looking at satellite data, which can detect uh, landscape changes over much wider spatial scales, we also used a drone to look at very fine scale spatial um, patterns of deforestation. And so this is just an example of our drone flying in Malaysian Borneo. Um, and why this is really useful is this is allows us to collect this very, very detailed data on land cover and actually map deforestation as it's happening. And um, so this is an example of the same site in Malaysia, um, but only several weeks apart. And this is, an this is an incident where we were able to actually map deforestation as it was ongoing. So to capture this clearing while it was happening and look at how it, this impacts all these different populations. The next step is really thinking about these populations and how they, they fit um, within these landscapes. So of course we needed to look at macaques and to understand how macaques are using these different types of landscape. And um, so to do this, we GPS collared a number of macaque troops and this is collecting data on the locations that macaques are moving into. So we're able to look at how they're using these different landscapes, how far they're moving and how these movement patterns change in response to deforestation. Well, of course, in our ideal world, we would like to GPS collar every single macaque in Borneo. We obviously can't. And um, so we also looked at a number of other ways we can estimate wildlife populations less invasively um, and from a distance. 
So this is an example of using thermal cameras. So this is thermal imagery that detects heat signatures. And we use this to, to identify rapid pop estimates of macaque populations. And um, so both of these images below are at the side of a river with macaques roosting in trees. And what you can see is from these thermal images, you're able to pick out these little bright dots, which are actually macaques roosting within these trees. So from this, we're able to identify how many macaques are in an area. And this is particularly useful when there's very poor visibility. So situations like at nighttime or with very high canopy cover. And then of course, we really needed to look at mosquito ecology. So where are the mosquitoes as well? And to do this, we did a number of entomological studies in different habitat types. So looking at different types of forest, different, type of ag different types of agriculture um, and villages and close proximity to households. And we did, we did a number of different studies to look at mosquito ecology in this area. We collected, um, so one, we looked at human landing catches. So actually collecting mosquitoes as they were coming to land on a person's leg. So this is the example in the bottom corner um, and working out how many bites a person would receive. As well, we looked at different water bodies so whether or not they had this mosquito larvae. And we conducted a number of different mosquito trapping methods that we used at both ground level and within the canopy um, to look at what mosquito distributions are within these different environments. And so from this, what we were able to determine is that the primary mosquito vector of Plasmodium nolzi within this area is Anopheles balabasensis. This mosquito bites outdoors and the highest biting times are between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. And fitting this mosquito data to a number of different environmental covariates and predictors, so things like rainfall and weather, we're able to actually develop models to predict how many bites a person is likely to receive at a particular location at a particular time. The kind of final component of this is looking at how people fit into these landscapes. And so we're particularly interested in where people are at these hours between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. when mosquitoes are biting. And we know this is occurring outside. So to look at this, we conducted a GPS tracking study. So it's a bit difficult to see from this picture, but this child is actually wearing a small GPS tracker like you would take for a run. Um, and we were able to collect this very detailed movement data that allows us to build models of individual space use to work out the probability an individual is in a particular location at a particular time. And we're able to then use all of this data to expand at a community level. So to look across entire villages where people are likely to be going during these times and how often they use these habitat types. And finally, thinking about how we integrate all these different sources of data together, we have data on land cover, we have data on human space use and movement, data on mosquito density, macaque densities, um, and infection prevalence within these populations. And what we can show is that we do see this increased exposure to infected mosquito vectors is occurring around forest edges. So people are likely exposed in, around forests, but also still in close proximity to households where they're spending most of their time. Finally, we wanted to look at much, much wider spatial scales to see if these patterns are true at population levels. Um, so this is a number of community-based surveys we conducted. We actually tested over 15,000 people to determine exposure and infection to Plasmodium nolzi and other malarias. And what we found is there's much higher prevalence than was detected at health facilities. And we find there's not just nolzi in this population, but there's also other simian malaria, so Plasmodium cynomolgi. And we do see these patterns where there's very strong associations with fragmentation, agriculture, um, increasing risk and forest actually being protective. And so with that, I'd like to end there. Um, so thank you very much and just acknowledge all the people who participated in this research. Thanks very much, Kimberly. That was a great talk. I think, you know, getting this kind of these detailed pictures of what's going on really kind of adds loads more um, kind of depth to some of the kind of general, you know, uh, studies that we've been looking at about, you know, saying, well, you know, range edge is important, but it's really interesting to see how you approach it from all these different angles. So um, let me just have a quick look at the, some of the questions. Um, um, 
so I guess there's a question here saying, um, should we target, again, this is one that I asked before, but target active management against certain species that increase risks? And I guess for mosquitoes, that's a bit of a no, no brainer, really. Yes, we try, um, not always successfully. It is really challenging, particularly when you're looking at outdoor biting and, and mosquitoes that live in forests. Um, so many of the things that we use around households like bed nets and things that protect people are not particularly effective in this, in this situation. Oh, okay, I've got one here that's, uh, oh, I've got a couple of questions appearing for you now. Um, what evidence is there that Nolzii can be transmitted from human to human as well as macaque to human? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Um, so it can, it can be transmitted. And the reason we know that is that in the 1930s, they actually looked at Plasmodium nolzi as a cure for syphilis. Um, so there are some very ethically dubious studies that infected American prisoners or volunteers um, with nolzi to show that you could have nolzi that would be, um, could be passed to a mosquito and then be passed to another person. So all of the genetic evidence and the modeling evidence we have so far suggests that this very rarely occurs in the wild, um, but it is actually the focus of some ongoing work we have with the World Health Organization at the moment. Okay. Well, um, because we're running a little bit late, I'm going to um, I'm going to stop there with questions. I think we're going to open it up now to a Q and A, um, where I'll go through some of these questions and um, see if anybody wants to answer them. So some of the ones that, so starting at the, the top here, uh, the most popular question here is, um, how significant is the impact of climate change on the propagation of zoonotic diseases? Is it likely that climate change will cause more pandemics in the future, such as the one that's happening now? Considering we're talking about land use, I don't know whether anyone wants to take that one on. If not, anyone? I can go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, so, I mean, it's a huge question in a sense, right? So in a way, when we think about land use change, we're often, think about, um, we're often thinking about ecological processes that are going on at relatively localized scales. You know, we're thinking about, you know, as Kim was show, as showing these kinds of, kind of quite small scale landscape transformations that can really influence risk, you know, along borders of meters or kilometers. But when we're thinking about climate change, we're thinking about really profound shifts in how the environmental conditions um, allow species to persist. And so there's you know, already evidence that a lot of species are moving around the globe to track kind of optimum climatic conditions to basically move away from areas that are getting too, too warm for them and into areas that kind of better suit them. So there's kind of a few factors going on here. Firstly, we're gonna have novel communities emerging in the future, right? New sp species that haven't come into contact with each other necessarily before coming into contact more. So this could potentially lead to, to kind of increasing spillover events, not only between, I suppose, wildlife and people, but also between wildlife. So there are kind of conservation issues here as well. Um, but just to give one specific example, rather than ramble, um, I'm, I do quite a lot of work on dengue. And so the Aedes mosquito that transmits dengue um, is, uh, you know, obviously a, an urban specialist, but also there's kind of evidence that as the, the planet is warming, um, that it's spreading more widely across the planet and this is potentially leading to kind of bigger outbreaks of dengue in places that haven't experienced it before so it's absolutely already reshaping disease risks now and will continue to be a huge influence in the future anyone else yeah i mean i i agree with everything you've just said the other thing i would say is that land use and climate change are not disconnected and um, so we've seen really large forest fires we've seen extreme weather events that have flooded areas so when we're talking about land use change, we're often thinking it's only human caused or directly human caused. And there is an interaction between these two and um, that are incredibly important for disease. Do you want to say anything, Christina, or shall I move on to the next one? Okay, um, just to say that was my, my point as well, so you stole it. Um, <laughs> okay, um, great, let's move on to the next one. So the next one, I'm just doing them in popularity here. Do eco-tourism practices in which people have direct contact with wild animals make it easier for pathogens to make the leap from wild to domestic hosts? Can tourists be made more aware of this risk? Do you see this as a big problem? So I can jump in on that. So I, I think it is a risk for, for certain areas, but I do think there are conservation organizations that do a really good job of addressing this. So I'm 
I think conservation doctors um, in Uganda, which kind of deals with communities around um, mountain gorillas, which are very sensitive to human pathogens, um, do a really good job about educating visitors and kind of promoting this One Health idea. So there are organizations that do a really good job where there's lots of evidence that this is really important for the wildlife and, and human interface. So I, yeah, and I'm gonna get that organization on. Um, I can't really speak to that, so I'll move on unless. Um, okay, so the next question here, does rewilding areas and bringing back natural habitats without human in interference decrease the likelihood of diseases spreading zoonotically? I can Anyone? go. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so there, there's not much research done on this yet. So we know a lot about how communities disassemble, so how they break apart, but we're not great at understanding how they reassemble. So in Scotland, there's been huge rewilding efforts. And I think there is kind of an interest alongside of this to look at how that changes Lyme disease and, and, and important domestic pathogens, like domestic sheep pathogens, like liver fluke. Um, but I think the jury's out. Um, I'm not sure of anyone who's looked at this sort of process, but I think it's going to become increasingly important as this is an option. Yeah, I can add that there are some ongoing projects in Borneo um, looking at reforestation and particularly reforestation to meet some of these climate change commitments. Um, but again, I think it's the same conclusion where kind of the verdict is out. <laughs> I guess my, my initial thought is is how much is is you know reforesting rewilding going to work with increasing populations increasing demand for food and non-sustainable actions so I guess it's uh, one of those things that whether it's academically interesting versus whether how much is going to go ahead is, is something that I think about. Rory do you want to say anything or shall I move on? Yeah, the only thing I would say as well is that you know I think if we're thinking about you know global scale issues I think that you know, we know that some of the most effective ways to prevent people from getting sick is to improve their socioeconomic status in various different ways, right? So it isn't solely an ecological problem. Like a, a very large part of this is also to do with understanding how the ecology interacts with where people are at. And, you know, I think when we're thinking about building resilience to kind of climate change and changes in ecosystems, we need to be thinking about how to improve um, yeah, how to improve people's socioeconomic status in ways that helps um, give them better access to healthcare and, and um, you know, reduce the chances of these kinds of spillover events occurring. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Okay, so my next, the next question here is, um, so can we design agricultural landscapes that are less risky from disease transfer viewpoint, e.g. E a greater mosaic of trees and crops and agroforestry? It's something that there's quite a lot of ongoing work on. And I, I think malaria is actually one of the best examples of this. So it's quite famous kind of malaria history of people, particularly in Italy in the 40s and 50s, filling in the ditches and managing these agricultural landscapes in a way that really decreased mosquito populations. And so there is evidence that this can work. And I think it's something that really needs to be focused on. Um, but, um, others. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything from the Lhasa fever perspective, but, but in some landscapes and agricultural landscapes, when you're managing for those pests, if you have a more um, ecologically friendly uh, management of agricultural systems, you can actually support high, higher biodiversity of rodents that decreases the Mastomus natalensis. Um, the data is still out on that, but it seems to be the case where you have more sustainable agricultural systems that you can actually reduce prevalence of that important zoonotic reservoir. Rory, do you want to say something? Um, it, just to say, yeah, I mean, I think that this is a really important um, question for Lassa, and I think it's something that's kind of increasingly something that we've been talking about and thinking about. But yeah, the kind of, I guess the jury's out on what it means for Lassa because there's so in a, in a lot of ways, we don't really understand how big a deal Lassa is and how, how widespread it is, yeah. I guess from some of the work that I do, it's it's that thinking about our sort of unintended consequences of how, 
how we you know man manage landscapes and thinking that well okay let's do something to get rid of um you know let, let's stop uh, hunting happening so then we bring in lots of livestock and all we're doing is, is transferring from one problem to another so i, I think that um when we're talking about ma managing and designing landscapes that that some of this kind of general work might point towards you know kind of whether land sharing or land sparing type um sort of divisions may, may be most effective or whether you know we're currently ending up in what Christina was talking about, these kind of worst case scenarios most of the time where we're just, lots of things are overlapping. We've got lots of edges, you know, bringing it in, in Kimberly's work. So, so we're, whether we're just sort of sleepwalking towards this kind of perfect storm situation or whether we, we can actually start kind of trying to think more holistically and, 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 and bring these, these sort of elements together. So I think we are, reach the end, I think that's right, is it? Uh, I'll, come, I'll come back in, yeah, thanks so much Dave for, for keeping an eye on time. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry we can't keep going because there have been so many questions coming through um, as a result, a result of this evening's event. Um, thank you all so much for your contributions um, tonight. It's been great to, to hear from you and, and hear about some of the case studies and examples you shared as well. Um, and a big thanks, thanks as well to Ellie Darby, who's been working behind the scenes and is the producer of tonight's event. Thank you, of course, to all of you who have been watching this evening and sending in your questions as well. I'm sorry we didn't have time to answer more of them. As I mentioned at the beginning of the event, we we are really keen to get your feedback um, and try and improve these events for the future. So please do share that feedback with us. Um, you can very easily do this by going to SurveyMonkey. I'll share that link now on the screen. Um, so please go to surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event two in order to tell us what you thought of tonight's event, what you liked, what maybe we could improve, perhaps what you would like to see us covering in the future. All really useful information for us. Uh, speaking of the future, next month's uh, event um, is going to be on Tuesday the 8th of December. Slightly different topic this time, we'll be looking at putting reptiles on the map, ZSL science for reptilian conservation. Um, so please do join us for that and for more information information about that event and other events uh, coming up in our program, you can find out more on our website, which is zsl.org forward slash science forward slash events. And indeed, if you go onto our website, you can obviously find out more about all of our research and conservation work at the Zoological Society of London and ways that you can get involved and help and support our work too. So please do consider making a donation and consider joining and supporting us in other ways, such as through our fellowship programme. All details about that can be found on our website. But for now, from me and for all of this, from all of this evening's speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. <laughs>